Yeah, I'll explain. Um, when, Chris, when I talked to Chris about what, what I should be billed as, there was some dispute as to where I am. And the answer is I never let quite know. Uh, I'm a visiting professor at the University of Bath, having spent 31 years as a professor of software engineering there. Um, I'm a visiting adjunct professor of music in the National University of Ireland, Maynooth. And my two co-authors, who have at least approved the slides very quickly, and don't necessarily approve what I'm going to say, are both at the, uh, well, Victor Lazzarini is at the University of Ireland, Maynooth. Uh, Stephen Yee is a research student there, and he spends most of his time in Rochester, New York. Uh, and I'll see if I can get this computer to work. Um, in some sense, I, feel, I always feel a fraud in these activities because I'm not a music, I'm a total amateur self-taught musician. I play no instruments other than the computer at any level of, of competence. Um, my background is computer algebra, and I started off uh, writing uh, cosmic waves, uh, waves and all that sort of stuff. Um, and music was a fun thing for my, my own amusement. Uh, I was at a computer algebra conference, and I was told there was going to be a wonderful meeting in Delphi to celebrate Yanis Sinakis' 70th birthday, who is a great hero of mine musically. And I went to it. Absolutely amazing. Uh, totally unlike the world I was used to. People were actually polite and friendly, and they didn't just come and shout and scream at you. They do, they've done that since, but they didn't at the time. Um, I met composers who I never thought I'd ever meet, uh, and as a result of actually hearing one of the pieces of music, I went home and bought a CD player, which shows how much a technophobe I really am, uh, as you will see later. But what I want to talk, draw attention to at the moment is a talk by uh, Jean-Baptiste Barrier, who was then at AirCam, talking about the AirCam workstation. And looking at the age of the people in this room, I doubt many people have come across the AirCam workstation. It was going to solve the fundamental problem that people at AirCam were writing pieces of music using a computer, and then the computer died and wouldn't be resurrected. And there the, mu the music had totally gone. So they're going to have a single piece which everybody would use, and then every piece will be preserved forever on the ERCAM workstation. Uh, if you can find an ERCAM works audio workstation these days, you're really clever. <laughs> this started making me think, thinking in the background, I've been thinking for years about this problem of data loss, pieces, losing pieces of music. So that's, as it were, a, a sort of preamble as to why I'm t talking about this stuff at all. Um, it's already mentioned I have some communication to see sound. Uh, I was trying to find a picture of a dinosaur to try and give you the right flavour. Sea sounds written about 1985 by Barry Verco at AirCam. It wasn't an ab initio, it was a rewrite in C of software which had lived previously, going all the way back to Max Matthews. Um, Victor told me to in increase the line saying we every line of code has been rewritten at least once since then. Um, and we're currently in version 6.0304, it's sort of in development. It's genre neutral, it's a sound music computing system, it's got a compiler and a very efficient rendering engine. Um, so my friends tell me. My enemies don't talk to me. Uh, I also point out that th this software was originally re released under the MIT license. Now, the MIT license was considered to be very open source in the days when it was invented, because it meant you could use it, and you could look at it, the only thing you weren't allowed to do was commercialise it or distribute it. Only two people in the world, three people in the world are allowed to distribute it for most of its life. Barry, me, and the Computer Desktop Project. Um, but since 2003, it's been open sourced um, under LGPL. So we have moved on. The code base, referring to an earlier talk, is, in, is on G, uh, GitHub at the moment totally visible, and that's a thing you have to learn the hard way. It's currently got a library of about 1,800 opcodes, or unit generators. That's, that's to say, if you go there and say, how many have you got, it says 1,800. And it gives you a long list of them. They divide up into lots of different sorts, like sound generation, sound modification, that's the filters and the synthesizers. Control operations in general, arithmetic, you know, adding numbers together, talking to the computer. One of the things about it, all software will evolve to the state where it can send email. CSound sent its email a few, uh, nearly five, ten years ago now, I think it was. Um, the other thing about it is it's a very diverse community. We say it's genre neutral, and I'm amazed the sort of music people produce with it. I'll give you some examples later. Um, 
We have mobile application customers, we have sort of programmers, we have other people. Um, this is a remark, this actual slide comes from an earlier presentation I made in, in Australia last year. It's got a long history, the legacy of music written of CSAN that is worth preserving, at least to someone. Now, I'm not making a judgment on people, other people's music. Um, I don't understand the difference in house and garage if there is a difference, and I never listen to it. Um, that's not the point. It's worth preserving, and this has given us this completely backward compatible philosophy. Um, and everything we do it has to be backward compatible. That's what's built in. And I want to talk about what that means. That's just a remark to say the community of what does. They drive us. They look after us. So this is the philo philosophical remark. Every piece written in C-Sound at any point in time must be renderable, i.e. playable, in every ver later version with no audible sound difference. Um, we would like to say bit accurate, uh, but that's actually not feasible because computers don't actually agree the way they do rounding at times. And the parallelism introduces a bit of bit randomness. But that's our fundamental rule. Everything must work. Now, there are lots of ways this can be done. Well, three spring to mind. This is the simple way. Do nothing. Whatever you do, never change the code. That way, everything will always be the same. Um, it, some people are smiling as if they might even consider con this idea. And obviously, this is lunacy. There is a, there's, a, there's a halfway ha um, thing which says you, you produce a, 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 web, a, a site somewhere which every version is preserved in ASPIC. So you can tell the people, yes, it may not work on today's, but go back two years, you'll find the right version. Um, yes, it has an its traction, but it's really not very good. What we actually do is this. We add new stuff. We're in, under continuous development. Um, code goes in at a tremendous rate. And earlier ways of using it are protected. Every, whenever you do anything, it must still work in the, for the past. And this is the sort of great advertising thing. The very first piece written in c sound was written in 1985 by uh, Richard Boulanger. It still runs. It runs exactly the same, including this, the thing where he got the audio wrong, but don't tell him. Um, and it's actually used as one of our standard test problems. However, as you can imagine, this is not necessarily a trivial exercise. It's slightly different from what most software engineering people seem to want to do. Um, there are problems. This is a, a hobby horse of mine. Um, when, many years ago, people used to talk about the MMI, which was the non-PC uh, version of HCI. It was called the Man-Machine Interface. <coughs> I've always wanted to rename this the Musician-Machine Interface. And Musician-Machine Interface is not the same as HCI. This is from experience. Musicians, uh, I don't want to try to upset people, but musicians really are strange people. They behave differently in many, many ways. This has been observed by many people. You give, give a musician a piece of software with a bug in it, and they find it, they will use it. They will make it the centerpiece of their work. <laughs> they, they push things to, to the extremes. Um, just as an aside, there was a group in Sheffield who once had the idea that writing a piece of music was like building a piece of software. You have a design, you have a specification, you, you do an in instantiation, and then you create it. And so they, they got two composers who were used to working together to write a piece. And they bugged them what they did. They bugged the computers to see how they did it. Well, you know what happened. They'd start the big, big picture. And then they'd say, oh, that's an interesting bit. I'll do this little bit down here. Software engineers would go berserk. And when they do that, they'd go back and do the other thing. And then they would lie to the other guy what they'd done. <laughs> I mean, they're not going to tell everybody what they're up to. Now, apart from the joke side of that, it really has implications for fixing bugs. Suppose you find a bug, as one hat. Well, obviously there are no bugs in C sound really, but you find a bug in a sort of sub part of it. What do you do? In, in the real world, you fix the bug. Not here you don't. You never know. Somebody out there, we don't know who, is probably using that bug. And if you fix it, they, will, they have a reasonable reason for complaint. A gross fix, yes. I mean, if there's a case which it always crashes, then that I... I consider that to be different, you know, crashes are crashes. But the audio has to be the same. So errors remain, remain. So what can you do? You either lead to multiple versions, you have lots of versions of, of a filter, 
Now you have the one which doesn't work properly, and the one which is fixed. And if you ever look through the CSOUN opcode list, you'll find a lot of opcodes of foo and foo1 and foo2. And that's usually what those are, not always. Um, let's, this is an explicit example. Uh, I looked at the dates so that the, the, these are right. 1996, a couple of Canadian guys sent me a message saying, we've got some code for doing head-related transfer functions. Would you like to put it in CSOUN? Okay, you haven't got any of that stuff. Put it in, fix the obvious sort of C-type errors, you know, the usual students have come. It worked well, not very well actually. But it was used, it was around for ages. Um, it didn't get heavy use, I suspect, because of its rather nasty features. Um, 2008, a guy called uh, Brian Carty, who was a PhD student at the University of Ireland, Maine Newth, uh, I was actually his external examiner on that occasion, before I had connection with them, he produced a, a whole suite of new HRTF operations, which are absolutely brilliant. You can, his demonstrations at the, at the PhD exam are such that I've never seen a PhD student demonstrate so clearly that it worked and it didn't, there was no glitches and there were no crashes and it was wonderful. So we took his code and it's in there now. So who's going to use the old one? I don't know. Somebody might. So it's still there. And if you look now, you'll find that we now have six functions for doing head-related transfer functions. The older one and, and the, uh, the new ones which actually work in some meaning of the word work and they're much better, they're much better operations but we have to keep them, we have to keep the old one around what we'd like to do is to, is to retire things, you know like say nobody in their right mind should use k dump there's a technical reason why you shouldn't, you should be using dump k but you can't do it because it's been there for ages. So what we do now is we actually we do put out a little message saying you really ought not to be using this thing. So either you get, people get irritated by it and change to the, to the other one, or it just stays there. Um, it's not as good as it ought to be. We ought to tell them what, what, how to replace it. The alternative we have considered but not yet done seriously is to write a compiler to compile C sound to old C sound to new C sound with all the bugs removed. It's doable, but a bit of a pain. The trouble is, everything I've talked about so far sounds a little bit like we're sticking rather sort of conservatively to what we're doing. But musicians do need new things. <laughs> as well as them wanting to push the bugs and push the, uh, the special cases and all the nasties, they want to use the glossy tools as well. So we have to do this. This is just a small list of things we've done in the last few years. C sound isn't can be used embedded in things like Max or a VST plugin. So it's, it's usable from other places. You don't, it's not as a main thing. Um, dri driven from other languages. This is just a random group of languages. Uh, live coding systems so you can replace things on the fly, which is totally alien to the normal way of CSound used to work. But it's there now. Um, CSound servers <coughs> using UDP are around. Um, mobile devices, we have working on iPhones, um, Android devices, uh, new one, actually there was one at the weekend, I managed to check out what they've done to, to change it. Um, web systems, we've, we've had a client side web CSound system for decades, but we now have server side ones, so you don't have to install the software, you just run the browser. Multi-core support, parallelism, GPU opcodes, these are all things which are just part of developing better stuff. Um, part of my world for years has been musicians deserve the best software they can get, and preferably without having to pay for it. Um, so I'm, I, I should point out, I'm a Yorkshireman. And a Yorkshireman is like a Scot without the generosity. You know, nev never buy if you can get it other ways. Um, the other side of this, of course, is we've, we've developed this API in a number of languages which allows other people to build on it, using CSOUN not as a programming language, but using it as a library. And this, is, this is becoming very common among a number of people. What they do, of course, is outside us, the developers, the core developer domain, though there is an overlap, of course, of the people. So we don't have to maintain. If they want to break the rules about backward compatibility, that's their problem. But what we have to do is maintain the API um, in the same way as we preserve the, the old code make it available to people. Um, this, is, this is just the sort of latest thing I'm playing with at the moment. 
there's a, there's a score language in CSAM which is pretty crude and trivial. Um, we're currently working on making better ways of doing that, making it easier for people to write their own score generators inside the system rather than have to fight it all the way through. Um, and an ongoing project is to document the internal structure, extend the API to tell you what, what the internal data stripes are like so you can write your own language on top of it. You don't have to use the somewhat bizarre 1960s, 1970s style assembler language, which is what CSAN really looks like. Um, I'll tell you more about that later if I have time. Um, so we are, we're still moving forward. And we have to have this, this is still at the heart of the whole thing. Everything we do, we have to be aware of it. We actually argue about this sometimes. Is this really compatible? Is that not breaking something? We have a big fight at the moment about macros. I entered into a macro system some years ago, and it was, it was horrible. It's got, it gets, it, semantics are wrong. I corrected it in, an, in a certain version, and now everybody's saying, ah, oh, yeah, but it's not the same as it used to be. And I'm, I'm actually contemplating having two macro systems, you know, macro and macro, or correct macro or something. Um, so we don't always get it com completely perfect, um, but we're pretty close. It's not, it isn't, it's, an, it's, a, what, it's what we'd like to do what, the, what we achieve. As long as developers stay with the principle, composers, performers, sound users can be safe in not losing pieces due to hardware or software. Particularly as we move towards things like web develop, uh, deployment. Um, another feature which I think is important into the whole CSAN community is we have a number of developers, and I forgot how to count, there's sort of 30 people on the list, of whom, say, three are absolutely core and just contribute all the time. And then there's a sudden, another group of d who do a lot of stuff, but not so much all the time. Every one of the core developers and the first rare round are composers, or at least pretend to be composers on a, on a, on a Wednesday. Um, I speak for myself here. Um, and as composers, we don't want to lose our pieces. We don't want to, you know, having struggled to write, to find enough Wednesdays to write things, we don't want to lose it. So that's the reason why we're behind this stuff. And I thought I would end by producing three sort of, not quite examples, three sort of statements as to what this actually means. John Channing's famous Stira, Stira 1977, it was sort of, it exists on vinyl and CD, but in some sense it was not renderable until Kevin Dehar and some other person whose name I've completely forgotten uh, rewrote it in CSAM about 2007. And it's now there. It's safe. It's safe in the sense that not only can you play it, you can toy with it. You can tweak it. You can change it if you don't like the sounds. It's really there as an experimental device. Um, this, I, th I think, is sort of... That's the, the furthest back piece I, I know that we've managed to preserve. This is a sort of more like today, well, a couple of days ago. Um, CSAD is known as being this big dinosaur which produces this sort of strange mainstream computer music. Uh, Oivind Branseg, who's also one of our uh, uh, sort of second core developers, uh, used it on his bridge installation. There's a URL there which is broken, but it's there. He's got microphones over the bridge, and it, if you go to his web, that website, you can actually hear one of his pieces using the bridge as the main sound. It has the down, uh, up sample, or whatever, which way around it is, to make it at the audio range for the sounds off the cables. Well, that's a picture of the part of the bridge. So that's a sort of totally different sort of use of CSAM from what we're used to. And which leads us to the obvious problem, if, if we've had the past and today, what happens to the future? Um, I've always been very cagey about predicting the future. People say, what, we once had an exam question at the university I was at saying, what will computers be like in 50 years' time? And I thought, what a, what a silly question. Um, if you look back 50 years, we didn't even barely knew they existed, never mind what they looked like. And what's more, as far as I can tell, no, no science fiction writer has predicted anything really like happened with the exception of the machine stops by uh, E.M. Forster, which predates all computers anyway, but describes the web perfectly, like it's broken. Um, this is the statement we, I, which we sort of believe. CSAN will be everywhere, because it's still everywhere, you just don't always notice it. Um, any form you like it, and much more music. Um, but, 
people like me will still be able to use the correct way of using computers, which is the command line. <laughs> none of these icons, none of these mice, real computers, as, it, as we were intended to use them. It'll still be there. And that's, that's well, uh, until they shoot me, I suppose. Um, <laughs> that's essentially the world. That, so what I'm trying to present to you is, is the, the tensions between trying to t take something which people use and want preserved in one sense, but moving it forward into new worlds with new ideas. Um, it's used all over the place, not just for music. There's, my favorite one is the guy who's doing car simulators in Sweden. He's using CSAM to, to generate the engine noises and passing vehicles and things. So I couldn't show you that because I'm, it's sort of commercial somehow. Um, anyway, I think that's all I really want to say. How many more minutes have I not got? Uh, it's about Oh, I stop. Uh, so, questions? Yes. Um, I want to ask so you said you preserve all the functionality over time. That means you have probably a lot of duplicate functions. But yes. This is only within versions of the process. So, if someone um, submits a patch to a button, Finds a new name for the function where the project is in, and then yeah, basically. Okay. You, I mean, we try to. If it's basically a replacement, then we tend to use the same name with a digit on the end. But, okay. but yes, that's essentially what we do. And there's no. It's, it's known as it's known as opcode bloat. Okay. And there's no high-level API which would always use the fixed functions. Let's say. No, because they. Example that you use, then you just say, okay, this is. The, the, one, the ones which not, you shouldn't use are, are marked in the manual. I see. Um, there is actually also a way of saying this piece will only render if, if a version is later than this number. Uh -huh. But I, nobody ever uses that, but it's been in there for years. There's also one saying it only works for earlier versions. I'm not sure what the purpose of that was, but it seemed like symmetry at the time. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that doesn't worry me too much. Um, we, we are actually only dependent on one library. Okay. We're actually totally dependent on LibSAM file. LibSAM file is brilliant. It's beautifully written. And part of the bits I snuck in at some stage. <laughs> well, Eric rewrote that, so Eric. <coughs> so we, we, we've got one library we do depend on, yes. Um, that, of course, is also open. Uh, apart from that, we, we have... We have ported it. I mean, I personally have ported it to lots of machines. We're running on, what, six different operating systems at the moment, to my knowledge. And if it doesn't work on one system, we, we fix it quite likely. Yes, there's always a problem that somebody will change what a computer looks like in a manner I can't imagine. So, yes, there, there, is, there are dangers. Could compilers change something? Yeah, at the moment, one of the... We used to have a situation when every different operating system we used had used a different compiler, a compiler from a different manufacturer and it ran without warnings in all, all different systems. I was very proud of that moment. It only happened for a short time. These days, we're largely using GCC uh, and we're using some of the um, later <coughs> stuff that name I can't remember. Clang. No, we haven't, we haven't moved. There are people using Clang. We haven't, uh, we haven't moved to it yet. There are people using Clang on the Mac. Um, sorry, the latest version of C, whichever year it is, this, this uh, yeah. whichever one it's come to this year. Yeah. yeah. Um, we are slowly bringing some of those. There are places in the code where there are option compilations which says if you're on a sil silicon graphics, you can't do it that way, it don't work. And there are not many of them left now. Um, but maintaining, comp uh, it work maintaining it works on all, all platforms is indeed part of the work, I'm afraid. Uh, yeah. um, so this, this idea of preserving the music uh, has interesting implications in terms of music distribution, in terms of predicting the future and so on. Mm. Do, do you have any insights on the aspects of uh, music? I assume if I downloaded the opcodes for the John John and Craig, I could just play it on my computer just by oh, yeah. generating. Yeah, the yeah. Do you want a copy? It's on my machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, is there any uh, push or any uh, how to say advertisement of that idea that waveform is not the only way to distribute music? You could distribute the, I mean, scores is another way, but then it produces 
distortions it would because you had one orchestra doing one thing it's well essentially it's, it's what um sale was trying to do mm. which never really took off the off um was the idea is instead of distributing music you distribute instructions for creating music yeah um i've never thought about it very much um i think i have colleagues who worry about this much more um I, I don't know, I, I live in a, in a world where if anyone wants to listen to my music, they're happy to, you know, they let them do what they like with it, because mm. it's not, you know, I'm proud that anybody wants to listen to it. So I don't really care about the copyright in myself. Not from the copyright mm. aspect, just from the just, uh, uh, sort of music encoding aspect of it. This is a very interesting way of the, pressing it, it music, is, for example. It, it, like is, it is true it's that many, many of, the, of our community, when they put on their website, they put the, the, the sound file, they also put the, the orchestra and the score which created it. Right. Um, but we've never really encapsulated that in any sort of organised way. I think we ought to, actually. Is I, there actually, there is a project which I, I got halfway through and dropped, I ought to pick up again, which was to include that in the audio file anyway. Maybe I'll just pick up one more question and then any more in the break, so, yeah. Uh, it seems that the kind of sustainability of CISAL is down to you and one other person. No. Uh, I mean, it, so you think that even without the kind of the input of the two, three people, um, it will, it can, can be sustained? The, I believe so. Um, looking at it, I'm the, I'm the sort of thing that's been there longest, but I'm, I'm well, I, my career is sort of over, as they say. Um, I've been doing it for, since 1990, and I've seen all these changes. In that time, we've had a number of other core developers who've come in and then gone away. We've always had a, a, a sort of slight rotation of them. At the moment, the, the three of us are completely different stages of our career. I mean, the three who are core. I mean, Stephen's just, well, he'll get his PhD shortly, I believe. Um, I think he's already been in new ideas, and he's quite in, in, committed to it. So I, I, I believe that's the future for him. Yes, there's always a problem. You know, okay, we're, we're all travelling in a taxi somewhere and we've run into a lamppost. Yes, there's always that problem. No, and I, th I think that it's, the question is to what degree, I mean, this is kind of a niche C sound, like other of these are kind of not a huge community, several hundred people. So it depends but, well, on the thousand users, thousand but on people. So it depends on finding on the right person arriving yeah. at the right time to carry yeah, on. It's, it's, all I can say is it's happened so far. We've had a whole host of really quite exciting developers who come for four or five years, made a huge impact, then moved on. So, so far, it's worked so far, that's all I can say. And the code's there, you know, anybody can pick it up. I've talked about all I did, I just found it on the web one, one Saturday afternoon when it was wet, and sort of compiled it.